Hey guys, thanks for checking in. Uh, if you're just uh, watching this channel for the first time, be sure and hit the uh, subscribe. What's up to everybody that uh, already has? Thanks for checking in. I'm coming to you live via video from my deck once again. <laughs> it's a beautiful day, so why not? Better than being inside. Uh, I got a mix of thrift finds and some vintage Jamaican vinyl for you today. So I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, first off, I got one thrift store I went to that... Um, kind of had a long dry spell out, wasn't really finding much of anything there, and I popped in there kind of a little bit earlier in the morning than I usually do one day a couple of weeks ago, and right away started to find some good stuff. I think uh, the first one I found was uh, this one, Nancy Wilson, Today My Way, and these are all obviously from the same uh, collection because they got the o previous owner's name on here. She had some nice taste in records, so very happy to add these to my collection. Fishman, this one uh, had me thinking of you. I know you're a fan. It's, uh, I don't know, a little bit supper clubby for me, but I'll check it out again. Uh, this one I wasn't familiar with, but I thought I'd uh, trust this previous owner's taste on the basis of what I was finding. H.B. Barnum, everybody loves. And these are all kind of like early to mid 60s, late 60s. Uh, this guy is kind of R&B, a little bit jazz, a little bit pop. A mix of styles on there, very cool. But, uh, Hugh Masakela, Emancipation of. That is on Uni. Always love that label design. Normally only ever see the Neil Diamond stuff on it though. Uh, Ruby and the Romantics. That is on Cap. Of course, includes their big hit, Our Day Will Come. I think I, I knew first from the Carpenter's version of it. And Temptations, Getting Ready, one of their classics. That is on Tamla. All these have a bit of cover wear and a few little light scratches, but they're pretty good for 40 some odd year old records. Play very well, so I'm happy with them. Impressions, we're a winner. on Spartan. Of course the title track is one of their classics and also uh, Nothing Can Stop Me is on here. Just archetypal Chicago soul. Uh, huge influence on Jamaican music and just uh, arranged and conducted by Johnny Pate here. But uh, just beautiful vocals, beautiful arrangements and the songwriter you know, Curtis Mayfield. I mean, what more can you say? And I was very excited about these two. Mongo's Greatest Hits, Mongo Santa Maria, the great uh, Afro-Cuban percussionist. It's on the Burgundy Fantasy label. And also Soul Bag. It's uh, slightly later, I think. I think this is late 60s, 2i Columbia. Uh, the Greatest Hits one is like really full-on Latin jazz percussion. Uh, does not include Watermelon Man for some reason. But uh, yeah, just all uh, all Latin titles. Afro Blue is on here. Manteca, Sabrosa, killer, killer stuff. And the Soul Bag one is a little bit more on the covers of pop tunes that he was known for. You've got In the Midnight Hour, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. Uh, there's a nice version of James Brown's Cold Sweat on here. And there's Groovin' by the uh, Love and Spoonful, Green Onions. You've got uh, Bernard Purdy on drums here, Luis Gasca on trumpet, so just killer lineup of players. Wicked stuff. Then uh, about a week later, I guess, I popped in another thrift store, and there was a big haul of uh, kind of 70s rock, which uh, there was a bunch of stuff that kind of wasn't in good enough condition to, uh, to bother with, but uh, the stuff that I did grab, Floyd, Animals, this one's a little beat up too, plays with a little bit of crackle, but it's, it's okay. It's not something I'm going to go out and pay kind of full price for. It's so good enough for me. I think the only other 70s one I'm missing by them now is Wish You Were Here. Just never seem to see that one cheap. Lou Reed, Berlin. Very nice shape on this one. Uh, I've heard good things about this one. Joe Walsh. There we go. This 
one again, fairly good condition, a little bit of cover wear. Uh, actually, the first one I spotted was uh, this one, which if you can find this in a thrift store in uh, decent shape, you know you're in for a good haul. Hendrix, soundtrack recordings from the film, double LP, and the compilation there. And this one, this is Stories. They had that song, uh, Brother Louie, you know, Louie, 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 Louie. Cool gatefold there. And I got a copy of uh, Bob Dylan's Greatest Hits. Very nice shape and includes poster. This one was uh, kind of a blind buy. I didn't know, I'd never heard of this one before. Haven't listened to this yet. Hooked on a Rose, it's called. And kind of an interesting gatefold there, if you can see that. And this is on... Uh, what's it called? Gas Records. This is from... Early 70s, I believe. Looks like... Uh, checking that one on Discogs, looks like it actually goes for a fair bit of money. And there was a few other ones that uh, either were upgrade copies or stuff I, I bought maybe to uh, sell or trade down the road, so I didn't show those. And there was a few other finds from various thrift stores. found this one, which I'd never heard of. Jamay. I don't know how that's pronounced. Jamay. Jammy. Anyways, it's produced by John Phillips. Kind of late 60s. I was expecting kind of folk rock. It's on Dunhill. And that's kind of what it is. Also, quite a contemporary kind of Beatles-ish sound. Kind of like, um, kind of like Sgt. Pepper, White Album kind of era. Pretty decent album, actually. I'll put some links to uh, sound clips of most of these in the comments down below, of course. Another one, Herbie Mann, Village Gate. i on a bit of a Herbie Mann kick lately. I pick him up when I find him. I think he's kind of underrated. Red Atlantic label. Got this for about 50 cents, I think. It's in pretty decent shape. And finally, I had some kind of... There's a record store I go to where they have some, uh, some cheap bins. Where, like, some stuff is cheaper, some's a little more expensive, but kind of the average price is around $4. And uh, it's usually in, in quite good shape. And uh, between that and the thrift stores is how I've built up a lot of my collection. So I grabbed this one, it looked kind of interesting. Color Me Country, Linda Martell. Haven't listened to this one yet. That is on SS International, which uh, Jeannie C. Riley, you see her albums on that. And uh, yeah, this caught my attention because it's got a cover of uh, Color Him Father by the Winstons, which I love that song. Finally picked up the LP of it at my last record fair. I think I was showing that on video. Yeah, you can see the Genie C. Riley albums on there. So yeah, it'd be interesting to check that out. Larry Coriel, The Eleventh House. I'm going to be a fan of this guy. I pick him up when I see him. Especially kind of the earlier stuff. This is 1975. Should be killer. New York City, Soulful Road. Yet another take on the iconic Beatles cover there. This is on Chelsea Records from 1974. Kind of sweet soul. Uh, produced by um, Tom Bell. Recorded at Sigma, so it kind of got that, uh, that lush Philadelphia International sound to it. And the last one from this, uh, this record store I got, Hawkwind, Quirk, Strangeness and Charm. That's only my second Hawkwind, and the second time I found one of their records at the same uh, same cheap bins in this same store. Charisma. Getting to be a bit of a fan of these guys. Not kind of my usual fare, but uh, yeah, I dig it. 1977 on this one. Again, uh, very, uh, very trippy sci-fi space rock. Touch of a punk influence on there, if I'm not mistaken. And lastly, I popped into my buddy who uh, is a record dealer, and you don't like you don't see a lot of vintage reggae around these parts compared to other areas of the world. I, I imagine a lot of places are like that, but uh, generally uh, there's a few, 
Europe kind of is a, is a good spot to look for reggae, probably New York, uh, parts of California maybe, but not really here. But there is one seller that I know, Kev, what's up? Hope you're doing well. And uh, he kind of hooks me up with some, uh, some vintage Jamaican vinyl once in a while, which he's pretty knowledgeable in that area. He's put out some uh, reissues. He did, uh, he did the Native North America set that uh, a few people in the VC know, which has been going around. And about almost 10 years ago, he put out a series of reissues called uh, Jamaica to Toronto, which was kind of tracing the evolution of um, reggae in Canada. Put out a lot of obscure records. Uh, Jackie Matu was one he put out. So uh, he still finds some uh, some stuff. I got a couple of seven-inch singles from him. These are all original. Psychedelic Train, Derek Harriet, Part Two on the flip. This is a, kind of an early reggae instrumental. Derek Harriet, a very uh, very prominent producer, kind of late '60s, early '70s, which is uh, this is from 1970. Talked a bit about Treasure Isle label before. You Roy, the uh, foundation DJ, which the DJs are Jamaican rappers, and uh, he was the greatest of kind of the first generation guys that uh, took it from the from performing on stage on the dance halls, talking over records and kind of interacting with the lyrics, and took that into the studio and made his own records, doing the same thing. And this is one of his early sides that helped make his reputation on the original Treasure Isle label. This is Tom Drunk, Hopeton Lewis, kind of the original record that he'd be uh, chatting over or versioning. And on the flip side, you get Mabruk, which it says Hugh Roy with Tommy McCook and the Supersonics, but really it's a Tommy McCook sax instrumental, a very sweet version of the Queen Majesty rhythm, which has been done over many times in reggae. And the last seven inch I got, Big Youth, Screaming Target, which is one of his big hit tunes, was the title track of what I believe was his first full-length LP, and this is a version of the Don Pan No 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 rhythm, which has been done over quite a bit in uh, in dance hall. I think it might be a bit familiar to some people, and uh, both sides are versions of the same rhythm, and uh, great bass on this one, just had my floors just about bumping for a 40-year-old Jamaican 7-inch single killer tune. I got uh, two 12-inch singles. I'm always talking about the Green Sleeves label on here, which was just uh, the label that was at the right spot at the right time as kind of late 70s roots was transitioning into the early to mid 80s dance hall. Most of the killer stuff came out on that. And this is one of them. Classic by Frankie Paul, Pass the Tushung Peng, 12-inch single. Once again, Henry Junjo Law's production, he pretty much dominated the first half of the 80s. This is 84, and uh, that was a classic tune uh, kind of celebrating the herb. And the B-side is equally classic. War is in the dance. I think more properly known as worries in the dance. As in uh, worries to anyone that is crossing Frankie Paul in the dance hall situation. Because he's going to mash you down. One other 12 inch. This is on the Black Ovation label, Battle of Lion. Uh, Hugh Brown, really better, better known as Hugh Brown and Ranking Joe, two top of top DJs of the time. This is 1981. And the B side is Ranking Joe Solo, Computer Watch, also a very good tune. But Battle of Lion is a killer heavy cut of the Rockford rock rhythm originally laid down at Studio One in the 60s. Very very hard driving, very heavy, and uh, kind of a, almost a, a meeting of the generations here. Hugh Brown kind of in that late 70s, still roots school of uh, DJs, and Ranking Joe a bit kind of more of the early 80s, moving into the dance hall style. Okay, Hugh Brown kind of faded away, but uh, Ranking Joe still very much active today as are Big Youth and you Roy. That's uh, one LP by Ringo, aka Johnny Ringo, Riding West. This is on the Jagaidence label. 
and it's another Junjo Laws production. I believe this is 1982. Some mean rhythms on here. Again, that kind of early dance hall DJing. And last up, I was very happy to score this one. I've seen this LP before. It's uh, I think it's not super rare. There's been various uh, releases of it, but it does tend to go for a little bit of money. This is Guru Nation, Count Ossie and the Mystic Revelation of Rastafari. This is a triple LP. It was the first one ever recorded in Jamaica, and possibly the only. can't think of another one off the top of my head. But I'll just try and give you an idea of the cover art here. You can see that. Inside, we have the whole group here. This is original UK pressing on uh, Shanty label from 1973. Now what this is, is Count Ossie was a Rastafarian drummer. Kind of a enigmatic, not really well known today, but very crucial figure in Jamaican music. He was actually discovered by Prince Buster. The, uh, the great reggae producer, who is kind of a, a scrappy ex-boxer upstart who is looking to make a name for himself. He'd worked for uh, Clement Dodd from Studio One before striking out on his own. And he discovered Count Ossie and his, his troop of Rasta drummers playing one day in a club and brought them in kind of early 60s, 1960, 61, to, to play on a track he was producing by a singing group called the Folks Brothers. And that track was called O Carolina. And that kind of very African style of drumming. First off, um, this was right as the, the Jamaican music industry was transitioning from importing records from the U.S. and kind of R&B, boogie styles, which kind of, that style had kind of gone out of fashion in the U.S. That source of records was drying up for them. So people like Prince Buster started looking to their own homegrown musicians to make their own records rather than relying on imported stuff from uh, other countries to keep fueling dance, keep trumping the comp competition, other sounds, playing in dance halls. That was how it all got started. So he put uh, Count Ossie on this record, playing his, his Rasta drums, and uh, that tune was a smash. The Jamaican radio uh, industry at the time, and, and uh, for many years after, was very, very conservative, did not want to play anything that sounded kind of African, but uh, they had to play that tune. It was too popular. It became a huge, uh, huge classic. And uh, was eventually revived in the 90s by Shaggy, who did his own version of that tune. The Folks Brothers kind of went on to uh, obscurity. I think they only ever recorded one other tune at the time. But uh, Count Ossie had, uh, he was an early Rastafarian. He had come up in the, kind of the Rastafarian settlements, compounds. At the time, there was a lot of, uh, we're talking like 1940s, 1950s, there was a lot of tension between the Rastas and the police in Jamaica. Uh, the, the police finally went in and cleared out some of the Rasta settlements, forcing them to disperse and recongregate in uh, kind of the slum areas of Kingston, like back a wall. And it was these areas where the Rastas would congregate and uh, play their drums, which uh, the drumming style is called Buru drumming. It derives from Africa. They would play these heavy bass drums, and there would be uh, what's called a keti, or a repeater drum, and a funde drum. And uh, they would hold what was called a grunation, which is a rasta gathering, where they would, uh, they would play their drums and chant and kind of debate theology and history well into the night. And uh, if, if you know uh, the Bob Marley song, Rasta Man Chant, I think it's on Burning, one of the early albums, Catch a Fire, maybe. That's one of these very traditional Rasta songs, which uh, they're hymns, basically, is what they are. And everybody that took part in these gatherings would, would know them. So Count Ossie, master drummer, he had formed this troupe of musicians to play with him and uh, recorded on the Folks Brothers, uh, kept making 7-inch singles through the, through the 60s for various labels, like Studio One, under kind of a variety of different names before forming the mystic revelation of Rastafari. And by 1973, the Rasta movement, which had been kind of kind of underground, kind of on the fringes, was, was ready to explode in terms of 
of uh, awareness, popularity through uh, through Bob Marley and, and people like that popularizing it. And they recorded the Grunation album, which was an attempt to reproduce in a studio setting these kind of, uh, of Rasta gatherings. So you've got uh, kind of spoken word poems and um, also included in the the Mystic Revelation group was uh, musicians like Cedric Brooks, later went on to form his own group, The Light of Saba, as well as putting out his own uh, sort of jazz-influenced albums under his own name. And he brings this kind of kind of free avant-garde jazz influence in there as well. So just a mix of songs and poems and tr throughout just the drumming, which uh, if Count Ossie was still around today, he would be considered a one of the, the founding fathers of the Jamaican recording industry. Unfortunately, in 1976, they recorded this album. There was a follow-up called Tales of Mozambique. They traveled around. They played at uh, the Newport Jazz Festival, I believe. And um, in 1976, they were playing at a, a stadium concert in Jamaica. There was a, a flash flood. There was an accident, and uh, the crowd stampeded. A couple of people were killed. So uh, with the performance delayed... Count Ossie went up to the, the country to kind of chill out and relax. On his way back, he was hit by a drunk driver. He was killed. And in kind of the, the chaos that immediately followed his death, um, his eight-month-old son, there was an accident at home, and he died as well and was eventually buried in his dad's arms. So the group carried on. Apparently, they, they still perform. They still gather today at Count Ossie's old home home base. They're still performing, still carrying the the African beat into the West Indies and beyond. And uh, that kind of what they call now called Nyabingi drumming has been a very crucial part of the Jamaican recording industry ever since. Kind of not really prominent on record. It gets revived every once in a while. But uh, that just that African underpinnings laid the, the template of what was to come, showing that this music is originating from Africa and in the African traditions. So that's about all I've got for you today. Actually, the uh, there's a very good article about Count Ossie that just came out, which uh, some of the details I just told you I didn't even know about until just recently reading this, uh, this article, which is uh, by David Katz, who is a well-known reggae writer and historian. I'll put a link on this to my blog page, which uh, be sure and check that out, you guys. Fat City Vinyl Music Blog. I'll put a link down below, of course. And that's all I've got for you today, guys. A few uh, CD listening. Rodriguez. Found this in the thrift store. This is kind of a 90s South African CD, actually, when he was well-known there, as the liner notes talk about, but uh, hadn't really been rediscovered here. So the liner notes by these South African DJs are saying, anybody who knows his whereabouts, let us know. It's kind of funny. They only knew what how the story would develop later on. And this one I was just listening to yesterday. The Go Team. Go Team. UK band. This is from 2004. They are kind of a UK pop group. They do a mix of like sampling and live instruments. Just a very high energy kind of mix of soul, funk. Uh, kind of Some of the songs sound like it should be on a 70s cop show uh, theme that kind of funky beat, and a mix of hip-hop beats, just wicked high-energy stuff. If you're, uh, you're at the gym or doing some cardio or something, you want, you want something like that to listen to. It'll pump you up. But uh, that's about it, guys. San Diego Roots, big up. Keep it, uh, keep it on the reggae tip. Fishman, peace, my brother. Uh, yeah, that's about it all I've got for you today, guys. So I'll check in with you soon. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and check out the blog page, and peace.